Hello, and welcome to the Pen Habit. My name is Luke the Dog, and we're happy to have you here today. It has recently come to my attention that my friend, Matt, has been spending far too much time playing with and talking about fountain pens and not nearly enough time giving me head scritches, belly rubs, or food. Clearly, this is a situation that must be remedied as soon as possible. It would be a real tragedy for a certain 1929 Waterman's Ideal Number 7 with the red flexible nib to end up in pieces on the floor. That, of course, is not a threat. I would never be so crass as that. I'm just saying, I have heard ebonite is quite tasty. In any case, now that I'm in charge of the pen habit, I... Luke, what are you doing in there? Oops, gotta go. Hi, everyone, and apologies for Luke the dog taking over. He will not be hosting the pen habit, but uh, I guess that's what I get for teaching him how to run the camera. Uh, welcome back to the pen habit. I've got another Q&A session for you, a real one this time where I actually answer real questions. And uh, so I figured let's go ahead and dive right in answering some questions about fountain pens. Nat Sora from Twitter asks, what camera and lens do you use in your video and photo setup? How long do you use a pen before you're comfortable to review it? Uh, so my main camera, that one right there, is a Panasonic Lumix GX7 Micro Four Thirds camera, and I run it uh, through my iPad, which is right here. I can control it from the iPad because it uh, has a built-in wireless transmitter. Uh, my overhead camera is a Sony Handycam, just a cheap Sony Handycam that will record in 1080i, I think. Um, and then I have, for my microscope camera that I've used in a few videos, a pluggable little microscope camera. I think this was 45 bucks or something like that on Amazon. Um, so those are the cameras that I use, and I use the Lumix also for my still photography uh, when I do that as well. As for how long I will use a pen before I'm comfortable reviewing it, it varies. Uh, if it's a pen that I own and there's no timeline on it, a lot of times I will, I'll use it for months before I do a review. Um, sometimes I'll record a review, use it for a while longer before I put the review out and realize I have to change my review. Um, so I'll re-record the review later on. Sometimes I don't get a lot of time with a pen. Uh, this is particularly true if someone has lent me their pen. I don't necessarily want to keep it for six months. Uh, so I will use it a couple times. I try to get at least a couple of different inks through it to get a sense of how it feels. Um, I'd say on average, I use a pen about a month before I will do a review, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. No Mercy Notices, also from Twitter, asks... Do you by any chance know how to clean this? It is a Monteverde Artista crystal cap, and the ink is behind a clear insert in the cap. It got there during transport. Uh, so specifically, no, um, or in general, though, a few things you might want to try. You might want to try filling the cap with pen flush or an ammonia, a 10% ammonia or bleach solution. So that'd be 10% ammonia or bleach or bleach, not and and 90% water. Some inks uh, will react better to a bleach solution. Others will react better to an ammonia solution. So you might want to give those a try. The other thing that you probably want to try if you haven't already is to get yourself one of these. This is a really inexpensive little ultrasonic cleaner. I got it for less than $25 on Amazon. Uh, it works really well. Um, it will vibrate very quickly to get, you know, water or the cleaning solution inside the nooks and crannies of a pen. So a lot of times that will work. With clear plastic, though, sometimes a stain is a stain is a stain, and there's just not a lot you can do about it. It's one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of uh, demonstrator pens. I love the way ink looks in a demonstrator, but the staining is for me a little bit of a problem because I don't want a clear pen that's actually pink, you know, unless I order a pink pen, which personally I never would. Michelle Young from Facebook asks, have you ever talked about your daily carry pens? How do you choose what pen to buy next? 
Uh, Michelle, I don't talk about my daily carry because there, I really don't have such a thing as a daily carry the way most people talk about it. Um, I, there are very few pens in my collection. I don't feel comfortable taking with me when I go to work. Now I don't work. I don't have the exact same situation that many people do. I don't really have to worry about theft. I'm very gentle on my pens. My pens don't get put in shirt pockets or in pants pockets. So I'm not too terribly concerned about what pens I carry with me. Um, I try not to carry too many expensive pens. I try to always have one pen that I don't really mind if someone who isn't versed in fountain pens uses, aka not a flex nib, something with a very rigid nib, aka rather. Uh, and uh, if it's a particularly fragile vintage pen or a pen that has a nib that's going to be very difficult to replace, uh, for instance, my Waterman's Ideal Number no. 7, uh, which is from 1929, made of ebonite, that stays home. Um, but most of the rest of my pens, I will take with me to work on occasion. Um, but I only ever carry three. So I use my Franklin Kristoff pen wallet here, pen box. And uh, the pens I have at the moment are the stunningly beautiful Delta Fusion 82 in midnight blue, um, or moonlight, I think this is called. This is a limited edition from Chatterley Luxuries. Gorgeous material. Review on that coming up. Uh, I have my Lamy 2000 inked with Diamine Autumn Oak. And right now I have the uh, Visconti Divina Elegance, but it ran out of ink today at work, so I will be cleaning that out tonight and <laughs> taking a new one with me tomorrow. I have a new Faber-Castell Loom that I have been meaning to try for review purposes, so that's probably what will be replaced or what will replace the Davina in the box. So hopefully that answers your question. Richard Armstrong from Facebook asks, I work in an office environment, so my inks can't be too out there color-wise. So I wonder what ink you would recommend as being different, but still business-like. I'm on the prowl for new ink. Well, Richard, I don't know the specifics of, uh, of what you consider uh, business-like. I will say for personal notes at work, use whatever the heck color you want. It could be fuchsia, it could be bright orange, it could be yellow, although I don't know why they make yellow fountain pen inks, but that's a whole different story. Um, it Don't worry about it if it's for your own personal notes. Use whatever color you want. Now, if you're signing official documentation and you need to use more understated inks for you know official documents that get passed around, I guess I understand that. I work in a digital environment, so we don't use paper really ever. Uh, I'm pretty much the only person who even takes notes on paper. Everyone else brings their laptops. So uh, let me walk you through a few ink samples. I've actually been in the process of cataloging my entire ink collection. I'm about two thirds of the way through on these little index cards. So it'll give you a sense of what I've got. But a few examples uh, for blues, which is kind of the standard uh, business color. Noodler's Bad Belted Kingfisher is a nice blue. It's also permanent, so that's a cool one. Private Reserve DC Super Show Blue is nice and bright, but still blue and very rich and saturated. Of course, there's Noodler's Bay State. I'm going to zoom out here just a little bit. And apologize for some of the detritus you see around <laughs> the screen here. I'll try to get some of this out of the way. Um, so Noodler's Bay State is a great ink, um, but, you know, put it in a cheap pen and bring a bottle of bleach with you if you use it. Uh, Private Reserve American Blue. This is a blue I like a lot. Doesn't get a lot of attention. This is the fast dry version, which is which may be great if you've got ink that uh, or paper that isn't necessarily great or that needs to dry quickly. Um, Diamine Majestic Blue is nice. And then my favorite blue is Pelican Edelstein Topaz. So those are blues. If you're going to go blue, I like a vibrant blue. I don't necessarily like an understated kind of washed out blue. If, I, if you're going to do blue, at least make it an interesting one. Some other options are in the blue-black category. And the first one is Pelican Edelstein Tanzanite, which I like a lot. Uh, a little bit more toward the black side. Likewise with Diamine Denim, which is a nice rich blue, and Diamine Eclipse. One ink that I just got a sample of, and I kind of love it, is this Diamine Regency Blue. 
which I have not used in a pen yet. I just dipped it and did a, a cotton swab. This is what I'm going to ink up with next. This is a really cool color. I like it a lot. So, and it's a nice dark blue. Uh, so you might want to give that a try as well. I will say though, if you're looking for something other than blue, and I would be because I think blue is kind of boring. I like blue, but it's not my favorite. Look toward the browns, the greens, and the purples. Uh, browns in particular, I think aside from blue and black, brown is an ink people don't think of a lot, but is a nice next step away from blue and black that is still kind of understated and, and not too over the top. So some options might include Private Reserve Chocolat, Diamine Chocolate Brown, Pilot Eroshizuku Yamaguri, Ackermann Behakt Hogs, I think that's how that's pronounced, Pilot Eroshizuku Tsukushi, excuse me, and J. Urban Lidete. Now, the J. Urban is a little more caramel colored, has a little bit more yellow orangey tones to it, but it's still nice. Uh, these are a little uh, washed out. Very rich, dark brown color is probably my second favorite brown of all time. Uh, my favorite brown is the Karandash Grand Canyon, which unfortunately is out of production, and I haven't really found a great alternative to yet. Nothing that, that writes quite the same as that. Um, for purples, I've got a couple that you could look at here. Uh, one is Noodler's Violet, which is kind of a, a little bit brighter. It's a bit brighter on the video than it is in real life. A um, little bit of a blue undertone. Private Reserve Ebony Purple, if you're looking for a really dark ink that looks almost like black and has just a hint of purple color in it, this is a really good one. The, the text is a much better indication of what it will look like than the swab, which this shows more of the purple than the actual writing does. It goes down almost completely black. And then finally, my favorite inks are green inks. Um, now I understand that uh, in olden days, a letter written in green ink indicated sexual perversion or that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know what that says about me other than here's some greens that I like. So along the, the same line as a Private Reserve Ebony Purple, here is Private Reserve Ebony Green. Um, Noodler's Javago is an interesting ink. It's black with just some greenish khaki undertones. Um, it's not my favorite ink, but if you're looking for something very understated, almost black, Zhivago is one you might want to give a try. And then I really like Private Reserve Avocado. Um, again, it's a little darker than this sample would indicate. Uh, kind of the color of the outside of the avocado. And, and I'm thinking more the um, uh, Fuerte avocados than the Haas avocados. So, the, you know, the slightly lighter, bigger avocados. Um, that's kind of the color that that is. So those are a few what I would consider work safer inks, um, but not necessarily boring blues or blacks. So hopefully that helps. Ali LM from Facebook asks, is there any sub $100 pen that offers a good semi-flex nib out of the box? Um, Ali, short answer is no, not really. Not if you're looking for a modern pen. Um, there are very inexpensive semi-flex pens, flex semi-flex pens, uh, both either Indian made or noodlers, which are also kind of Indian made. Parts of them are anyway. Um, I'm not a big fan of those kinds of flex nibs because I've used real flex nibs and those they're fun to play around with if you're just getting started. But if you if you're serious about wanting to use a real flex nib, I wouldn't bother. Then there's, for modern pens, very high-end pens that have fl flexible nibs. Now, they're not quite the same as the flex nibs you're going to get on vintage, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, I'm thinking the Omos Extra Flexibile. Stipula has a T-flex nib, a titanium nib. You'll find that they'll give you a fair bit of line variation, but they're going to feel kind of spongy. They don't snap back to their original position as, as cleanly as a vintage nib would. Probably the most interesting modern flex nib I've used is the nib on the, the Pilot Falcon nib. And I'm, now I'm not talking about the nib on the Pilot Falcon. It's, it's kind of confusing. But Pilot's Custom Heritage line, for instance, the 912, the Pilot Custom Heritage 912, comes with an FA nib, or they call it a Falcon nib. Uh, so, and that is uh, what I would consider a full flex, a modern full flex nib. 
And my experience with it has been pretty good. I've got a review of it coming up in a few weeks, uh, very likely. So, um, but that you're gonna, you're not going to find that for under a hundred dollars unless you find it used somewhere. I suspect um, if you buy it direct on eBay, it's not too expensive. However, if you're looking for a real flex or semi flex pen, I would really encourage you to look at some vintage stuff on eBay or somewhere else. If you get a pen that's made out of black hard rubber, oftentimes they'll call BCHR, so black ch uh, chased hard rubber. Um, you black pens are not the most sought after pens. And so you can oftentimes get really good deals on honest to goodness, vintage flex nibs in a black pen. Um, certainly you can find some for under a hundred dollars. And if you're willing to try restoring them yourself, you could probably get it for even less than that. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of help, but there's really no one that I, that's putting out sub $100 pens currently with flexible nibs that I would recommend. So that's just my take. Uh, Rob Pina asks, since you've had the opportunity to try pens from almost all of the major manufacturers, would you mind sharing some overreaching thoughts about each brand? For instance, what, ma what makes each brand unique to you and what are the best features of each brand? Uh, Rob, I could probably do a 12 hour treatise on this question. So I'll just touch on a few things. Um, for me, you can, even more so than brands, regions tend to really inform how a pen feels. So uh, for instance, Japanese pens tend to be very functional and understated, especially in the low and middle end pens, middle range pens. Um, the high end pens tend to be works of art. Generally speaking, the nibs are much finer than their European counterparts, which I'm sure you've heard me say before, and they tend to have more feedback to them than the super smooth nibs you might get elsewhere. Um, I'm thinking Pilot, Sailor, Platinum. Of those, Platinum is probably my favorite, Pilot being second, Sailor being third. Uh, my favorite Japanese pen, aside from the Nakaya that I have, which I do love, which is one of the very high-end work of art pens, um, is probably my Platinum 3776, which I really enjoy quite a bit. Um, I've got the Chartres Blue version, which is beautiful. And now that I've smoothed the nib out to my liking, I use the pen quite a bit. Um, American-made pens tend to fall into one of two categories. They are pens made in China by American companies and are generally fairly inexpensive. Um, my experience with those has been the quality of the body is usually pretty good. The quality of the nib is very hit or miss. Sometimes you'll get a great nib, sometimes you won't. Um, and I think that has to do with uh, with just a lack of quality control when it comes to the nibs. Uh, I'm thinking of Monteverde, uh, Jaffa, or Jaffa pens, Conklin pens, that sort of thing. Generally speaking, if I buy one of those pens, I buy it with the expectation I'm going to have to work on the nib which is unfortunate because if they could fix the nib problems on some of those less expensive pens, they'd have some really killer writing instruments because I think the bodies of the pens are really quite nice. Um, on the other end of the American-made pens are the Edisons and the uh, the Franklin Christophs, which are usually very well made. They spend a lot of time working on the nibs. You can't go wrong with pens like that, in my opinion. At that point, it just comes down to what do you like in a pen? And if and if one of those companies has something you like. I love both Franklin Christoph and Edison pens and have since the first ones I got. German pens tend to be uh, a little bit flashier than the Japanese pens, but still a little on the understated. You know, you've got that very efficient, very um, streamlined look. I'm thinking Caveco, Pelican, um, oh, Mont Blanc, that sort of thing. You, you're not going to see a lot of super flashy pens. You'll see some and more so than you'll see from, from Japanese pens. Uh, generally speaking, the nibs tend to be a little smoother. And since most nibs are made in Germany anyway, by Bach or by um, Yovo, they generally know from nibs. Generally, you're going to get a pretty good nib on most of your German-made pens. Um, and, and the construction quality is usually top-notch. Italian pens are my favorites. I've said this many times before. They tend to be much flashier. Um, 
they tend to be high performance in my opinion, but they also tend to be very persnickety. Uh, so for instance, you know, you might get, I kind of think of them as the Lamborghini of pens. They are really flashy. They grab your attention. They're made out of amazing materials. Uh, sometimes they don't work as well as you wish they would, especially for as much as they cost. Uh, when you get one that works though, you're not going to find a better pen in, in my opinion, that's my take on them. It's just frustrating. You know, my, one of my top five pens, in fact, my number one pen from last year was a stipula Etruria, the uh, limited edition that I had gotten. It was a beautiful pen, um, great material, great workmanship. The nib was a mess. I fixed the nib and made the nib the best writing nib in my collection. Um, unfortunately the nib collar, the collar on the nib unit broke. Um, neither Yaffa, the American distributor, nor Stipula had those nib units available to, to buy or to replace. So I had to ship it off to Italy for repair. That was in June of 2014. It's now March of 2015, and nobody knows where my pen is. I'm not sure I'll ever get it back. Um, and considering it was a rather expensive pen um, and one of my favorites, I'm not real pleased about that. On the other hand, I've had several Viscontis, uh, which I really like. I've had several Deltas, all of which I've really liked. Um, and of course, I have fallen in love with Omos pens. So Italian pens, expensive, flashy, a little temperamental, but when they work, there's nothing that works better. So that's kind of my rough overview of pens by region. If you're interested in my thoughts on specific brands, ask, but there are far too many brands for me to go into full bore. Albert Puebla, Alberto Puebla asks, favorite book and movie? Um, so favorite book, it's not particularly original, but I really love the Harry Potter series and have since I read them. Um, I'm a big sci-fi fantasy nerd when it comes to books. So uh, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time, the whole Farseer saga by Robin Hobb, I love. Um, the Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson, that, that new series that he's starting. In fact, pretty much anything by Brandon Sanderson. He can pretty much do no wrong in my book. Um, I, uh, there, there's some, some new ones coming out that I really like, but I'm a sci-fi fantasy guy, and most of my favorite books are fiction. Uh, as for favorite movie, I love animation. I really love Pixar movies. Of those, Toy Story 3 and Finding Nemo are probably my favorites. I like comedies, but not your usual comedies. So Drop Dead Gorgeous, which is came out in, I think, 95 or 96. Um, Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion, really quotable movies. I don't like a lot of the, the boy, boy comedies, you know, the Jim Carrey's, the Adam Sandler's. I, I don't care for most of that stuff. Um, I, I, as far as dramas, I really like dramas, but I don't have the best taste in movies and I know it, but I don't really care. So um, I really love the movie, What Dreams May Come. Uh, I think it's just a visual masterpiece. Uh, and I have an emotional attachment to the movie, The War, starring Kevin Costner and Elijah Wood came out in 94. Um, but that's more about my growing up and the story really t speaks to me. And so that's, uh, that's a movie that I really appreciate quite a bit. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Um, Minwoo Kim from YouTube asks, I just want to compare my hand with yours. How long is your hand? Pinky to thumb, stretched, and tip of the middle finger to the bottom of your palm. Uh, okay, so this is my right hand. From the tip of my finger to the uh, bottom of my palm is seven and a half inches, which in metric comes out to approximately... 175 to 180 millimeters. And then I have a fairly wide stretch because I've played the piano since I was four. So I've kind of trained my hand to stretch like that. Um, it's about a hundred or 222 millimeters in width, which inch wise is just about nine inches. So right around nine inches, uh, width that way. Uh, I don't have the biggest hands, I, I have fairly slender fingers. Um, they're not quite uh, not quite as large as Stephen Brown's. He's got he's got really long fingers. So, at least from the videos I've seen. So hopefully that'll help you figure out where your grip might fit compared to mine. 
Uh, and then finally, last question is from Michael Elliott on YouTube, who asks, any danger to my higher end pens that are celluloid like my Omos? I thought orange, and I assume he means orange ink, can stain celluloid. Um, short version of this answer is, I don't really know, Michael. I, um, I don't have a lot of celluloid pens, and most of the celluloid pens I do have use a rubber sack. Um, the only pen where the ink comes into direct contact with the celluloid that I have is my Omos um, Ogiva celluloid. And it it's not a transparent celluloid, so I'm not too worried about staining. Now, I understand that um, a lot of old celluloid pens would have discoloration. I'm thinking of the jade color that that was on a lot of older Schaefer pens, I believe, I believe where um, if ink was left in the bottle, it would it would discolor the celluloid. I don't know how realistic that is on modern, so excuse me, I don't know how realistic that is on modern celluloid pens, um, but I would say that I have seen a, a little bit of staining from uh, private or private reserve DC electric blue underneath the, or in between the, the section and the feed unit of my Delta Unica that's in the orange celluloid. It's, I'm, I don't know if it's staining or if there's just ink caught under there, but uh, I do see a little bit of a darkening there. So I suppose it's possible. Uh, if you're really worried about it, stick with pH neutral inks. Don't leave them in the pen for too long and, uh, and don't pick colors that are so far uh, like super dark or super in contrast to the material. So, you know, if you're super worried about it, try to pick a on your, you know, if you've got one of the uh, brown Arco Omases, uh, try to pick a brownish ink and pH neutral and don't leave it in the pen for too long. Never let it dry in the pen. So hopefully that will help a little bit. And I'm sure there are folks who are more knowledgeable than me. So if you've got experience with discoloring celluloid, head over to penhabit.com and leave a comment over there. Hopefully that will help. Well, I think that is going to do it for this video, this Q&A. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can leave them on the social medias. You can email me penhabit at gmail.com or, uh, or you can leave them in the YouTube comments. However, I will say with all of the garbage that's been going down on YouTube lately, I'm not spending as much time on YouTube comments as I used to. Uh, so if you have a question you want answered, leaving it on YouTube is probably not a great way to go about doing it. Um, I may respond, but chances are I won't, or I certainly won't respond as quickly as I will through some of those other uh, channels because the YouTube comment section is a cesspool and it's all I can do not to turn it off entirely. <laughs> so uh, so if you have questions, go ahead and head over to penhabit.com, leave it over there or find the Penhabit page on Facebook at Penhabit Twitter. Um, I'm on Google Plus. So there are lots of places you can find and contact me. YouTube's just not the best one. So thank you again for watching and we will see you here next time on The Pen Habit. Bye.